Hello, everybody. If you don't know me, my name is Brooke Alford, and um, I am wearing a couple hats here tonight. I am an educator for Purdue Extension in Marion County, where um, I work with urban ag and natural resources. I am also, however, the past president of the Central Chapter Board of Directors or board, and um, so I wore both those hats tonight. Um, Purdue hosts these meetings on their Zoom channel and INPS really, um, a lot of credit goes to Nancy Tatum for organizing the events. Um, and we try to keep them monthly. And then, and when weather's good, we include some outdoor events as well. So thank you for being here tonight. Um, we are going to hear from Amanda Smith and Steve Sass, and I just want to introduce them really quick. Uh, Steve and Amanda are the co-founders of Indiana Nature LLC, which includes the educational initiative IndianaNature.net and its corresponding social media outreach, as well as the, um, you might have to help me here, Ecometrid brand, is that correct? That's right. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Their popular Facebook group, if you aren't on it, is In Nature, that's capital I-N as an in Indiana nature, contains the Great American Indiana Nature or G or GAIN, G-A-I-N, GAIN projects, which have engaged thousands of users to collaboratively build a, da a database of moth, butterfly, tree, and wildflower populations in the state. And excuse me, I'm still letting people in. Um, <laughs> former chapter presidents of the Indiana Native Plant and Wild Wildflower Society, North and Central chapters, respectively. They have collectively served in numerous capacities for Indiana environmental organizations. Amanda is the superintendent of natural resources and education for Hamilton County Parks. Steve is a small business owner in South Bend. Currently, they are working on co-authoring several documents for the city of South Bend, including the 2021 <laughs> Natural Resources Management Plan, Indiana's first comprehensive municipal invasive species prohibition ordinance, and a draft of the city's first wildlife coexistence plan. Their latest project, and in partnership with Indiana University's Sustainability Development Program, is a publication tentatively titled Local Government's Impact on Ecologically Sustainable Ecological Sustainability, a guide to the ordinances, policies, and initiatives affecting Indiana's ecosystems. And I, for one, certainly look forward to those resources, so important here and everywhere. So thank you both for being here tonight. Um, as you just heard, my dog, dog is getting into barking mode. So I'd like to go ahead and mute <laughs> myself here soon and just turn this over to you. Um, I believe you have sharing capability. Um, thanks for having so us. Much. Yes. And it's, thanks, it's a uh, pleasure to be here. Oh, thanks to my friend Nancy, as you mentioned, um, that that got us involved in this. Nancy Tatum, I know she's here. So, <laughs> thanks, Nancy. So we've got a bunch of slides to go through. So we're going to try and talk fast and not keep everybody here um, for longer than you want to be. So the the title of our program, um, Botanical Time Bombs: A Historical Look at the Accidental, Intentional Introduction of Indiana's Invasive Plants, as you might have guessed is about the history of how the plants that are officially invasive came to be here. And by officially invasive, we mean those that are on the Indiana Invasive Species Counts as official invasive species list. And um, I'm not going to go read line for line what our purpose is, but essentially, like anything involving history, as the saying goes, if we don't learn from it, we're doomed to repeat it. And so hopefully throughout the course of this program, you will obtain a better feel of how these plants came to be in the United States from a historical lens and hopefully take forward something um, out of that that would that you can pass on to other people that will prevent us from making these same sort of mistakes again. The beginnings of this project go all the way back to 2017, um, as the bio mentioned, I have I serve in an official capacity for the city of South Bend, 
And in 2017, as the city was getting ready to do its annual Arbor Day Festival, which included a tree giveaway, I got a hold of the list of trees that we were giving away and advertising as being native trees. And we went through the list of trees and we found that probably out of the eight or so trees that they were giving away and claiming to be native, about half of them were not native to Indiana and a couple of them were not even native to North America and yet we were still billing them as being native trees. So this caused us to take a deeper dive into uh, the, the South Bend tree document. Most cities have these documents, probably your city does too, where we have a recommended list of trees that um, are uh, suitable for planting along the city streets. So we looked at the South Bend list and we did some analysis to it and we found out that of the 232 trees that they had listed in this document, 56.9, almost just under 57% of those trees were not native at all to North America. And in fact, some of them were even officially invasive and others had already shown signs of escaping cultivation. So we knew we had kind of an issue here. Um, and then 2021, maybe you heard, um, I was able to write an ordinance that got passed by the city of South Bend, which banned the sale and planting of all uh, 122 species of plants that are on the Indiana Invasive Species Council's official uh, invasive list. And in 2021, we took on an intern, Matthias Benko, from the Indiana University Sustainability Fellowship Program, and we had him researching the municipal codes and the tree list for all of the other cities around Indiana. I shouldn't say all the other cities, but in all cities in all 92 counties of Indiana, we had him look at and compile this database of. And um, what we found was that South Bend was not really at all um, the Lone Ranger here. In fact, most cities in Indiana had kind of terrible tree lists. This is one from, um, I think this was Fort Wayne, that um, we, we came up with these various categories, these buckets that we were putting these different trees in for the, the red color indicates exotic and officially invasive. The pink color is exotic and has escaped cultivation. Um, the orange color is exotic to North America, but hasn't escaped cultivation and so on. So we figured out that this was very a very common um, situation in Indiana where we had where our Governments are recommending trees that aren't necessarily good for our ecosystems. So out of this, we decided that we were going to create a book. And as we, um, as you read or you heard earlier, the tentative title to it was um, the page that's on the right-hand side. And as we began compiling these tree lists from around the state and municipal ordinances, it became clear to us that we didn't... Um, have really context for this to lay people. So if we if we put this book into the hands of somebody who didn't really know much about trees, it wouldn't mean very much to them. So we transitioned that into uh, what became or is becoming a series of writings or we call a collection of writings on Indiana ecology. And this history of these invasive plants was something we thought was very important to be able to tell the story of and how these particular trees and shrubs and Forbes got here. And collectively now in our series, we're calling this volume four, even though um, chrono chronologically, it's the first one that we're presenting. So that's what we're here to talk about tonight. And um, a quick note about the plants that we're going to, you'll see on the slides here, we assigned these superscript abbreviations to them, which you see over on the right-hand side, which are abbreviations or acronyms, which indicate the plant's method of travel or arrival in the United States. So for example, we have under accidental, we have um, things like contaminated seed and um, packaging materials and intentional, we have things like the aquarium trade, erosion control, ornamental, et cetera. And Steve, if I could just break in here um, to tie current street trees with our, our known invasives, not only have we found in some of these lists that we that we're still planting invasives um, that are you know labeled as invasive in Indiana, but we're also obviously seeing a lot of plants that um, have tendencies that would most likely put them on an invasive species list for our state in the future. And in doing so, we were curious about the how these you know current invasives were introduced into America. 
and that path. And one of the statistics we ran up against was that I think uh, we we breezed over it quickly, but that um, 82 percent of of um, said invasives in, in an area approximately were uh, products of the landscape trade or horticulture trade. And so we were curious and kind of backtracking then with the current 126 plants on the invasive species list, what was their means of introduction into America? And um, that ended up kind of, we didn't really intend, we were just gonna make kind of a spreadsheet. Um, and then we started finding in almost every case such um, amazing stories um, and, and really upsetting stories in some cases, which we're gonna share today, and also very interesting people through history. So we're going to kind of dive into that as we did in hopes to kind of help understand how invasives have used to find their way in how, and how they're still currently being used and finding their, their way in. So what we're going to do is take you on this chronological journey, starting with the arrival of the Europeans on U.S., what is now U.S. soil in 1607 with Jamestown, the uh, the first permanent colony in the United States and what is now the United States. And as the settlers were coming over, they were bringing with them plants from the old world. The plants that they were bringing with them at that time, that time were plants that were necessary for survival. So typically food plants mostly, but also a few things that were used medicinally as well. And they didn't keep records of the plants that were brought over in that initial voyage in 1607, but they started keeping records on successive voyages in 1608, 1609. And from the ship's records, we were able to find one of the plants that's now on the, invas the invasive, officially invasive list, which is wild parsnips or Pestinaca sativa, as was one that escaped from cultivation eventually, originally as a cultivated food plant. And then and that, um, that subscript, yeah. that C U L, is for culinary. We'll we'll call those out um, as we go. But that would be a culinary plant that escaped cultivation. And it was really a rough time to be a colonist over there. So in in sixteen o sixteen o nine, the winter of sixteen o nine sixteen twenty a third of the colonists died. So the plants that they brought over with them at that point were really necessary for survival. The The Native Americans were hostile to them. If they left the fort, they would most likely be killed. And so they, they persisted on these plants. Um, 1620 in Plymouth, Massachusetts, not, nearly half of the settlers died from starvation. And then in 1619, we have an attempt to start a silk industry in North America. Silk was very lucrative to the European settlers as it was something that was exclusive to Asia and the, and the Far East. And so in 1619, the Virginia legislature actually required that people plant and maintain, or every man, as they said, plant and maintain <laughs> a minimum of six uh, white mulberry trees, which were brought over for that purpose. Then later on, uh, this postage stamp that you see in the bottom, uh, James Edward Oglethorpe was a governor of colonial Virginia, and um, he imported over 500 white mulberry trees to try to also get a silk industry going. Uh, but why didn't it work? I guess there was a couple of reasons, right? Yeah, the a lot of really cold uh, weather, and then also the silk collecting from the silk moths, which we have a picture of a polyphemus moth up there, um, and its cocoon is below it. It requires a lot of work to to pull this silk off and then and then process it into into a fabric that was all the rage. And they really most of it was they just didn't have enough manpower. There weren't that many colonists here. And it was just difficult to to take off, and and uh, because really these these moths have to be fostered and fed. If you've ever you know collected monarchs, you know the work that goes into that. But then the secondary part of trying to get the silk from the cocoons was problematic. From a, a monetary standpoint, it wasn't it it didn't make a lot of money, and mm -hmm. so they shipped the colonists shifted over to other forms of agriculture. Um, particularly like in Ger in um, Georgia, probably things like tobacco and cotton and you know, other more uh, lucrative crops. 
would imagine. But they left behind the white mulberry trees, and we all know them to, uh, today. Every probably everybody here currently has one growing in their yard or in their neighbor's yard. So if we go fast forward to 1638, now there's this man, this Englishman named John Jocelyn, who made two trips over to the New World. Not very much is known about John Jocelyn, but he is notable for having written these two accounts, one on his, um, one in 1638 and one in 1663, about his accounts of his voyages over to the New World. And what's interesting about these books, particularly the first one, it was the it's the first book that talks about any of the plants that were available or that were present in North America, along with the plants that the colonists had been bringing over as well. And in the second book in 1663, an account of the voyages to New England, he talks about how the colonists were starting to allow themselves or afford themselves a few plants that were kind of ornamental in nature, they that weren't necessarily strictly for medicinal or food purposes but the three that were on here were purposely brought over for culinary and medicinal purposes which are saint john's word creeping charlie common barberry and um, this is the image of the gentleman on the opening slide which was i think this is actually william bartram but in 1728 john bartram founded john uh, Bar bartram gardens in philadelphia first botanical garden in the united states it's uh it's still there if you've ever visited philadelphia you can go tour bartram gardens but it was pretty famous for the standpoint that it was the first one in the united states john bartram eventually turned it over to his son william this photo or this this painting is one that amanda found of um, george washington visiting Bartram Gardens in 1787. Bartrams were uh, very popular amongst the, the colonial elites. So George Washington was a customer of theirs. Thomas Jefferson was a customer of theirs. He was and, close friends with Benjamin Franklin and um, also Quaker. And we see the Quaker tradition pop up in many botanists and, and plant enthusiasts. They, in quote, saw God in themselves and in nature and, and had a, a real fascination for plants in particular. And there was, you'll notice through this time, a real collection, kind of this collector's mentality to have as many plants and different species as possible, which was certainly a status symbol as well. It's notable also that Bartrams were both importers and exporters. And so they were not only bringing plants over here, which a lot of which eventually became invasive, they were doing the same thing in reverse to Europe. And then another early American, or the second, I guess, early American nursery was in New York and Flushing, New York, and that was the Prince Tree Nursery. And we call it, they actually refer to that as the first commercial nursery in New York. And on the map, I put a star on the location where it is now. So that's a New York Mets baseball stadium is the large green area below it to put an idea of, of where it was at. But the Prince Tree Nursery lasted until the mid 1800s or so. It passed through several generations of princes during the American Revolution when the British held Manhattan and New York. The British general who was overseeing it, um, was it Cornwallis, I guess, ordered guards around the Prince Tree Nursery because they needed the uh, the cherry trees for making rifle stock for the uh, the British efforts in the war. It was later named the Linnaean Botany or Botanical Garden. So in 1739, we had uh, the first documentation of white sweet clover um, in the United States or in the colonial United States. And we don't know exactly the reason why it was brought over here, but it was there's kind of an interesting story behind it. Frederick Granovio wrote this book called Flora of Virginica, or Flora, Flora Virginica or Flora of Virginia, uh, based on specimens that were sent over to Europe by uh, his colleague Johann Claytonus in this book, or John Clayton, who, um, if you know Spring Beauty, the wildflower that's that's flowering in my backyard right now, it's the genus Claytonia is named after John Clayton. In 1939, we also have a couple of other invasive plants arriving, field bindweed and contaminated seed. Uh, Moneywort are also called Creeping Jenny, Lysimachia pneumolaria as an ornamental often used in these hanging baskets. I presume that's probably where it arrived from uh, back in 1739 also. Pericalm then finds 
in a, in a written account travels into North America, he finds common privet like Gustrum vulgari naturalized in Philadelphia. Philadelphia seemed to be kind of like this hub for plant introductions. And so it's no wonder that some of these things are are turning up around then. Uh, interesting thing about Column, he was a one of the, the quote unquote disciples of Carl Linnaeus. So he was a pretty much a big shot in the in the botanical trade in those not trade but in the, in the botanical sciences at that time we added a couple of the range maps for the the native ranging for where these plants range natively and then initially you'll notice most of them are native to Europe so these are plants that are familiar with the settlers and therefore brought over because they they were familiar plants which is helpful I love the name of his book too I decided to keep the entire name because we've struggled with a short name for our our budding book. And I don't feel so bad when I read this, the, the, the title of this book, but um, um, pretty funny. The column also, also has a number of things named after him. Columns Lobelia, Lobelia Columnii, <laughs> and um, isn't there a moth named after yeah, Column also? a couple um, actually. Several. Sphinx moths, right? Which There's is... Sphinx moths and a lot of the micro moths have his last name. So he was in, in keeping in the, the tradition of the uh, the Swedish taxonomist. as he was uh, picked one of the people who Linnaeus passed, passed the torch to. And Steve, so, if, I, if I could, if you go back quickly to in what we're talking about, in some cases, we're in all cases, we're looking for documentation of these invasive species and something that we is tangible. So whether or not uh, later it's herbarium uh, vouchers and, and pressings and or books like what we have here, um, and in this case, th this is identifying when we first find it in the record, in this case, as an escaped species, but we don't necessarily know exactly when it was brought over. It certainly could have been earlier. And this is an indication of when it was, it was, it was documented as escaped. Yeah, it's the first record we've been able to definitively find of the plants. Uh, and we have in our bibliography that's associated with this, we have over 450 references. So we did a lot. This is actually about, uh, what, 16, 17 months of research or so went into this. So we're, we're relatively sure that um, in, in most cases, these are the first accounts that are first written accounts of some of these introductions. But like Amanda said, some of them may have been a little bit earlier, but this is the first time that we can definitively tie it to being in public. And in, 17, uh, 50, in the 1750s, we have a couple more ornamentals imported, Tatarian honeysuckle. We all know that one, one of the first of uh, four invasive bush honeysuckles. And then Norway maple Acer platinoides was imported by John Bartrand himself. Thomas Jefferson was an interesting individual. He obviously wrote the Declaration of Independence. He served as vice president. He served as president. He was ambassador to France. He was the governor of Virginia. And he complained that he just wanted to be a plant person. Um, that was his greatest joy in life was playing in the dirt and he did a lot of landscaping at Monticello, and um, not all of it was good, but uh, he was really big into plants, and it was, we mentioned before, he was a contemporary friend of, of Bartram. His and legacy is not good in several ways, complicated for sure, so that uh, it's, the plants fit with his social legacy as well, I think. Right. And but he did keep a lot of really good records at Monticello. And so we have a lot of these things to go back on and look like, for example, we have Vinca Minor appearing in North America, or I should say the United States, colonial United States, for the first time at Monticello that we know of. And Yellow Flag Iris is another one, both from 1771. So we put together these a, a series of graphs that we're going to Go off, go back and forth to throughout the program. The, the graph on the right hand side is the pre nursery trade introduction vectors of what we now have as invasive plants in Indiana. And you can see 80% of them, there wasn't very many plants pre nursery trade, only five that are now invasive. But of those five, four or 80% of them were culinary or medicinal, and the fifth was agricultural. So none were really ornamental and none were uh, accidental either. But if we go over to the graph on the right hand side, now we're looking at the, the colonial period that is post nursery trade. So the nursery trade, we, we pin back to the founding of Bartrand Gardens in uh, 1728. 
So from 1728 to 1725, we see a fairly significant shift in the introductory vectors of the invasive plants. So now we have 43% of them are accidental and 43% of them are ornamental. And neither of those categories were present pre-nursery trade and one plant as agricultural. 1775, we have the first documentation of Canada thistle in the United States, and that was in um, Vermont. And Canada thistle has the distinction of being the first plant to have any legislation written against it in the United States, and that was done in Vermont in less than 10 years. So they, we don't know for sure how Canada thistle came to North America or to the United States, but we know that they didn't like it almost immediately, and they took steps to try to stop it, which obviously didn't work. William Hamilton and the Woodland Estates. Go to Amanda on this one. So the William Hamilton was essentially a, an heir of uh, money and acquired this 300 acre or so estate in Philadelphia. You can see from the map, it was closely located close to the Bartram's nurseries and he was close friends with them. And he was a connoisseur and collector of plants, both from you know New World and uh, had a lot of these guys, like Steve said, had a, a lot of New World plants as well, which they were getting um, from other places in America and bringing them onto their properties, but certainly he was bringing in these exotic plants as well. Yeah. One notorious one for him was the Tree of Heaven. So, and it was by 1840, it would be available in the nursery trade. And he has several others that he planted ginkgo and sycamore maple. He had about 10,000 different species on his property. And the Woodlands is still there, incidentally, in Philadelphia. Both places are landers now. Bartram Gardens and, Woodland, and the Woodlands. So if you go to Philadelphia, you can go on kind of an invasive plant history tour of the <laughs> United States. That's what the uh, Schuylkill River, I believe. Yeah. Philadelphia. And there's a picture of a huge one that Steve took uh, of the Tree of Heaven. Yeah, that's on the tree lawn in South Bend, if you can believe it. It's massive and produces a lot of seed, but they don't get rid of it for whatever reason. Oh, in 1784, we have Mimosa introduced by French botanist and explorer André Michaud. He did so by sending seeds to William Bartram, who then turned around and sold it in his nursery. Michaud was an interesting guy, and he has a little bit of a local connection. Uh, if you've ever seen this tree, the swamp chestnut oak, which is, a, I guess, more of a southern Indiana species, Quercus michaudii, was named after André Michaud, a botanist. And um, he started a garden um, similar to how Hamilton and others did, um, but it failed dur during the harsh winter of 1787. So his garden dreams failed due to the harsh winter. Otherwise, he probably would have done more damage. Yeah, and his <laughs> was in New Jersey. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so it's the 1773 Prince Nursery Catalog. We were able to find the first documented example of the European cranberry viburnum or viburnum opulus variety opulus for sale at uh, the Prince Nursery. And they called it uh, snowball tree. Japanese honeysuckle comes over in 1806, also as an ornamental plant. And it's worth noting that in Charles C. Deem's Shrubs of Indiana, he talks about Japanese honeysuckle. Amazingly, in 1925, it was the only exotic honeysuckle that was even present in Indiana, but he really warns about it. He, from the quote from the book, he says that it spreads so rapidly that landowners fear it and are destroying it. But he's um, he's like, he's kind of confident that they're not really going to have very much luck at it because it's it's really moving fast and spreading. Here's the uh, some some things that came over or that were included in the 1807 Bartram catalog include such invasives as mugwort, English ivy, common buckthorn, Queen Anne's lace makes an appearance for the first time and as an ornamental plant or possibly with contaminated seed, but it's it's included in the catalog there. So they were selling it as an ornamental plant. And go through bouncing bed. Those are great historical documents that really helped us uh, to locate a lot of these plants. So Prince and Bartram's catalogs that are still somewhat around and, and that we could find. Yeah. And really 20 years ago, um, we wouldn't have been able to produce this information. It would have taken years of mm -hmm. going to libraries and, and probably libraries all over the, the country. But now things are digitized. So we're, we're truly at an amazing age. Talk about Elgin Botanic Gardens. 
Uh, so this is uh, this was our first public botanical gardens opened in 1801, and it was run by David Hossack and is the current location for Columbia College. And this was he was a doctor. And we see this a lot with bot botanical. Well, people who have a botanical interest, they were doctors, physicians, since uh, a lot of the plants that they were using or well, a lot of the medicine they were using were derived from plants. So there's a real connection to pharmacy and botany, especially in early times. This particular guy opened this, this gardens in 1801, which happened to be the same year that the son of Alexander Hamilton was killed in a duel. He was at that duel. He was also at the duel with Burr and Alexander Hamilton in 1804. So some notoriety, unfortunately, uh, for him. So he was at that duel at that time as well. So at his gardens, we have found evidence. Rockefeller uh, Center is what we have. Yes, that's right. So multiflora rose and Chinese wisteria were plants that he had there. And someone just asked a great question. This is where this garden used to be. So Rockefeller Plaza is uh, the old the old location for that garden. 1916, we have Indiana Theta. And of course, we have the the seal of the state of Indiana depicting a man cutting down a tree as a bison runs in the opposite direction. And we still have it. We do. Now, ballast <laughs> became an increasingly notorious vector for invasive plants to arrive in North America. And so ballasts, of course, were weights that were used in the hulls of ships to make them more stable as they made journeys across the Atlantic Ocean. So in the case of uh, a ship, and, and first of all, the earlier ballasts were dry ballasts, and later on they ship, they, they shifted over to uh, water or wet ballast. But the image in the bottom left depicts some workers that are shoveling rocks and soil and whatnot into the hull of a ship to weight it down. So conceivably, the ship might have been leaving England or leaving some port in Europe heading for the United States and carrying in the hull of it um, a bunch of invasive plants. We've got a little bit of a, a drawing here that depicts that where they would load up the ship when it's ready to set sail. Once they reach its destination, they would scoop out the ballast or drain the ballast if it were water into the port or the harbor of their arrival. And so you can see how this would have been a bad thing as far as transplanting invasive species go. We can track a lot of plants. In fact, there's about 10 or so on this page, some really terrible invasive plants, purple loosestrife and common reed phragmites, cattail, spotted knapweed, some of the are some of the worst ones there that are, that are all pretty much directly attributed to shipped ballast transfers. And in this graph, we're comparing intentional versus unintentional introductions of plants from the time period of 1610 to 1813 and then 1814 to 1852. So the graph on the left-hand side, we can see that only 13% or so of the introduced exotic invasive plants were done unintentionally. By 1814 to 1852 time period, it's almost half of the invasive plants are coming over here unintentionally. And we broke that graph down further into out of that 50% that were unintentionally introduced, 63% of those came via ship ballast with 1% coming from contaminated seed and then 2% unknown, which likely could have also been ballast. So ballast was a big problem and a, and a big invasive vector in that time period. Philip von Siebold was a German doctor who was working in Japan and collecting plant species, which was illegal to do in Japan. Japan was a closed off nation at that point. They guarded their tea plants very closely. And Siebold was eventually expelled from Japan for having smuggled some tea plants out of Japan, but he was also responsible for exporting about 500 or so species out of Japan. Now, they didn't come directly to the United States. They went over to Europe, but it was a lot of these plants eventually entered into the ornamental trade. The plant on the in the image here is not the princess tree, Polonia tomentosa, which is attributed to him, but this is um, Viburnum seboldii or Seabold's viburnum, which is not officially invasive, but this is one I found in a escaped area in St. Joe County. 
Uh, Johnson Grass and Autumn Olive both came over around this time period, the 1830s. On the, the first one of Johnson Grass unknown, Autumn Olive is an ornamental. Teasel was uh, brought over for manufacturing um, initially. So this was to pull the nap off of wool and other, other fabrics. So they would make fashion brushes where they'd put several teasel heads together into kind of a contraption and then use that to essentially raise the nap. Um, and so we had uh, manufacturers who were bringing over or bringing, having these seeds brought in so they could uh, manufacture these teasel brushes, essentially. In 1843, poison hemlock makes its way into the ornamental plant trade, of all things, being marketed as winter fern. And I took this photograph in February, and you could probably get an idea of why they called it winter fern, but um, talk about a horrible plant to be purposefully planting in your garden, one of the most toxic plants on earth. And also very invasive, of course. Steve, we had just had a question that we can answer um, okay. actually with this this picture. So um, asking about how do we how do we describe an escape species? So an escape species would be one that was planted, say, in a yard or in Bartram's garden, and then uh, finds its way out of the the you know where it was planted, and then starts to essentially escape or sometimes invade. A natural habitat. So this picture, Steve, was what at Lydic Bog, yep. um, which is a nature preserve. So we have uh, we have a invasive, not yet yeah, an exotic species that's now in this case as an escaped plant that is now creating issues ecologically for native species, which is one of the uh, one of the kind of earmarks of an invasive species. And a couple more privets come over in the mid 1800s. Hedges were gaining popularity in the United States. And so we imported more privets because privets make great hedges, of course. California privet, um, Ligustrum ovalifolium, and Chinese privet, Ligustrum sinensi, both as ornamentals. And then there was a real turning point in 1853 with the Perry expedition to Japan. Now, at the time we mentioned um, mentioned slightly earlier, the Japan at the time was a closed off nation to Western trade um, and everybody wanted to do trade with Japan. And the United States sent Admiral Matthew Perry over to Japan with um, some naval ships to nudge them into opening trade with the West, which they eventually did in 1858 with the signing of the Harris Treaty. And this opened up the floodgates to a lot of Asian plants coming over and, and escaping into the United States. As Amanda mentioned earlier with that one map that we showed, prior to this time period, most of the plants were of European or if they were Eurasian, they were of Western Asian origin. So that all changes really drastically with the uh, the Harris Treaty. And um, so around this time, we've got Morrow's Honeysuckle. Morrow was a botanist who accompanied Perry on the expedition to Japan, and he brought another one of the invasive bush honeysuckles with him amongst the 1,500 to 2,000 dried specimens that he, that he brought back with. That's Morrow in the bottom right of this photo. Bicolor Lespedeza, black swallowwort, enter the nursery trade, or excuse me, enter the enter the United States around this time. Actually, we're in, in the nursery trade. They're both as ornamentals. You want to talk about Asa and the and the book? So yeah, Asa Gray uh, published many uh, botanical journals, books that provided a lot of insight and direction for all kinds of of botanists thereafter, and is a great resource for that. So just one of the leading botanists, um, early American botanists for sure, and one that is referenced quite a bit. And these manuals of botany of the United States, there were by the by the late 1800s, they were up to over seven editions or so. And so they were great resources for us for being able to look for plants arriving in the United States that hadn't been documented, like say we would see a plant that was in the sixth edition that wasn't in the fifth edition, we would have an idea of, of the time that it, that it had arrived and escaped into the wild. George Rogers Hall was an interesting fellow. He was a doctor and uh, from Rhode Island, he, he traveled over to Shanghai to practice, but he quickly learned, and this is kind of hard to believe that the plant trade was more lucrative than the medicine trade. <laughs> And so he became a plant trader. And when Japan 
became open for trade. He moved over, moved from Shanghai over to Japan and began collecting and exporting a lot of ornamental plants, including Japanese honeysuckle. And um, there's a, a large list of things that he was responsible in part for introducing. Just had a, a something that ties into this place. So this is um, Fruitlands uh, Nursery in Augusta, Georgia, it was owned by the Breckmans. And um, Georgia being the peach state probably owes that to this particular nursery. They were really big into fruit trees, including peaches. This nursery and orchard essentially um, eventually becomes the grounds of, of the Masters, the golf course, the Masters, which I think was just on TV recently and uh, held. So interesting story there. And uh, is where burning bush, which we many of us have issues with in wooded areas, first makes its appearance, at least documented. At this time, it's really kind of worth mentioning that over the course of probably 100 years or so, the United States government actively encouraged people to import plants that they thought would be useful for American agriculture. Um, in 1819, we have a, a U.S. Treasury Department circular asking people abroad to be on the lookout for good plants to bring back with you. The Organic Act in 1862, much later, establishes the, the USDA. And the mission of the USDA, at the, that time at least, was to procure, propagate, and distribute among the people new and valuable seeds and plants. And then we have couple this time period with westward expansion, which plays a major role, kind of the next major jump in invasive plants but not necessarily directly. In 1803, we have the Louisiana Purchase, 1823, the Monroe Doctrine, 1845, Manifest Destiny. So Americans were moving west, right? We couldn't wait to colonize the remainder of the Western United States for ourselves. And in 1862, the Homestead Act opened up these millions of acres of the American West to settlement and farming. So essentially the Homestead Act made available to any person, any U.S. citizen, remember this is 1862 in the middle of the Civil War, they made available to any U.S. citizen land out on the West, provided that that citizen had not raised arms against the United States. So if you lived in Indiana or so at the time, or Pennsylvania, you could go out West and have free land as long as you hadn't raised arms against the United States, and that you would develop the land, which meant that you would live on it and that you would farm it. But the problem was, is that these people knew, in many cases, knew nothing about farming, number one, and number two, the soil and the conditions of the, of the West were very different than the East. And the prairie sod was very, very difficult to break through. And the plows that they had that were suitable for the Eastern United States soil didn't work out West. So that be, gradually began to change with the invention or the marketing, mass marketing of the steel plow by John Deere in 1837. Here in South Bend, we have the olive, we had the Oliver Chilled Plow Factory, which was another uh, company that made a fortune off of designing plows that could break up that dense soil, prairie soil. You can see the map I added to on that last slide is um, the three types of prairie, the tall grass, uh, the most eastern, the, the mixed grass in the middle, and then the short grass. And this is essentially where uh, these homesteaders were moving west to into uh, the prairies of America. And then the 1860s and 1870s, we saw a lot of invasive plants coming over. So remember, like Japan was now opened up. Ch travel to China was really common. So we had a lot of things that sawtooth oaks, but common buckthorn, lesser celandines are showing up, um, all of these as ornamental plants. And then the aquarium trade officially begins in the United States in 1865 with the introduction of goldfish for sale <laughs> at a pet shop in New York City. The aquarium trade was a little bit slow to take off because we didn't have the technology that we have now with filtration and air bubblers and things like that. But the pond trade came shortly thereafter. And we had we start seeing aquatic plants escaping into the United States. So float yellow floating hearts, parrot feather, Brazilian elodia, which is a really common one in the aquarium trade, anchored water hyacinth. Um, not we saw talk about hog. <laughs> 
Oh, he's notorious. <laughs> um, so yes. Hog uh, went to uh, Japan and um, and imported a lot of different species. He was appointed by Abraham Lincoln. He had an official title as marshal, as a consulate. Marshal, marshal to the consulate. Yeah. Yes. And um, and so he just brings in a ton of plants through his brother, who he shipped back to back to America. Some of our some really nasty plants came through during Hogg's assignment. Japanese not weed, of course. Now, garlic mustard is an interesting one because almost every account that you read of garlic mustard says that the early settlers brought it over as a culinary plant um, to cook with, right? There's a hundred different places online that state that, but we can find no real proof that that was the case. We know that it shows up officially for the first time. It was collected by this gentleman, George Vassy from the USDA, collected an herbarium specimen of it in 1868. But we don't know for sure that it was brought over for culinary use. It, it really remains unknown, but that's about the time that it came over. Chinese yam, Chinese maiden grass, both attributed to hog. Crown vetch shows up as a uh, as an erosion control plant, 1869. Again, these 18, 1860s and 1870s were really terrible years. Here's Hogg again. Um, he goes back to Japan and ships even more stuff back to the U.S. to um, the Samuel Parsons, who was his friend, who was the founder of the American Society of Landscape Architects. So we have Parsons. Asian bittersweet. And, yep. Uh, Parsons is also probably responsible for bringing over Japanese chestnuts, what would become the, the chestnut blight that takes out our American chestnuts. Yeah, great guys. Um, <laughs> hog, but I mean, look at hog. Look at these things. Asian bittersweet, kudzu, Maro's honeysuckle he brought over more of, uh, porcelain berries, sweet autumn clematis. So like, these are some really terrible plants that we're dealing with today so yeah thanks Todd. uh the so, arnold arboretum opens at harvard university in 1872 and it didn't take them long to start importing invasive <laughs> plants either so 1874 we have the amber cork tree in 1875 we have japanese barberry at the arboretum Did you someone just asked a question was there anything that some people brought into north america that was beneficial and sure. absolutely soybeans i mean um, like all of our food crops. Yeah, the food <laughs> crops in particular. So definitely worth mentioning. Not everything is um, is ecologically destructive. And, and a lot of it is is something, plants that we use every day that feed us. So yeah, we're only focusing on the on the nasty plants because we'd be here for weeks if we talked about all the plants, right? William Smith Clark was an educator that uh, traveled to Japan, was hired by Japan to establish a school of architecture over there. And then, like everybody else who traveled to Japan, he got involved in this, this plant trade and started shipping seeds over to the Arnold Arboretum, including uh, famously winter creeper vine, Euonymus fortunii. And what's curious is when we look at these, these um little subscripts most of these are ornamental yep. at, this at that point. time period for sure yeah. right big big jump we've got in the 1870s we have bull thistle unknown dame's rocket is an ornamental water chestnut as an ornamental japanese hedge parsley is unknown kate furbish she's like so, the lone woman <laughs> yeah. um so yeah she was uh she found a, a an herbarium, or actually, well, she has a plant named after her that is the uh, herbarium species that's here. Uh, but she was well known in, at her in her location in Maine, collecting and just going out on the countryside and, and trying to identify these plants. Wrote a book, but also was the first one to find Japanese hops as an escape species in Maine. She was unmarried oh. too, which was which was odd. So for her time. So um, post Perry introduction, look at the shift that we've got going on here. Now we have the ornamental plant trade is really dominating the invasive, the today's and what became today's invasive plants. Seventy six percent of them uh, of the introduced invasive plants in that time period were by ornamental purpose. And then we also have a jump or a major shift from Western Europe and Western Asia over to Eastern Asia with the opening of Japan and more frequent travel to China. Cyrus Pringle in 1887 did two notable things. He collected the first Bell's honeysuckle, which is the a cross 
a hybrid honeysuckle. And he also took the very the world's first selfie. Uh, maybe it wasn't the world's first, but it was, it was an early one. So if you look at the photo of him, you can see his left hand is holding a cable there. And that was a shutter release cable to a camera that he was taking a picture of himself somewhere out west. Um, USA and um, other places like the North, Car North Carolina Agricultural Experiment Station were constantly trying to import plants for use in agriculture in the U.S. And so we have Cerasea lespediza in, imported by the North Carolina Agricultural Experimental Station and planted for erosion control in 1896. 1897, we have the USDA sends this gentleman, Niles Ebison Hansen, to Russia uh, in search of plants, and he comes back with seeds of Amur honeysuckle, the last of the four invasive bush honeysuckles, and also the Arnold Arboretum receives species, uh, plants uh, seed from the Imperial Botanical Garden in St. Petersburg. 1898, the USDA establishes the Office of Seed and Plant Introductions. They appoint this gentleman, David Fairchild, as the first administrator. Fairchild did many things, Amanda. What did he he brought over? We talked about were all the plants bad? Well, no, here's a good example. So <laughs> Fairchild was responsible for like a lot of food crops, right? Yes. And the Japanese cherry trees that are that bloom around DC, which was a gift uh, between the government of Japan. He also married Alexander Graham Bell's daughter, or was it, yeah, daughter, I believe. But I think he was attributed to a lot of, a lot of food, food crops for sure. So back in Indiana, we had, and this is hard to imagine, 1899, Indiana led the nation in timber production. Right, which is crazy to think of. And, and this is a famous photo in the bottom right hand side somewhere in southern Indiana. That's a sycamore tree. And gosh, you sure don't see trees of that size anymore. Um, but Indiana residents and legislators apparently started to realize that they had a problem on their hand because they were starting to pay attention. So 1901, the governor establishes the Board of Forestry. 1903, we have our first Indiana State Forest. This guy is kind of interesting. Frank Meyer, which is an anglicized name. He was a Dutch plant explorer who worked for the USDA. USDA sent Meyer over to China to look for disease-resistant rootstock for the common pear tree, the Pyrus communis, which is our grocery store pear. And he came back with calorie pear as being a suitable rootstock that could be grafted onto it that was blight resistant. Meyer met with an unfortunate end. He was found drowned on the Yangtze River. Nobody really knew exactly what happened. The Chinese government said that he had accidentally drowned, but there were some questions as to whether or not he may have been actually kind of pushed or helped along into the river. But uh, this is the gentleman we have to thank for the introduction of calorie pear in, in 1908. And also the Arnold Arboretum brings Siberian elm over as an ornamental plant in 1905. I have no idea why. It's not a very pretty looking tree by any means, but um, it was considered an ornamental, as was glossy buckthorn um, shows up in, in Gray's Manual of Botany. Um, now, by this time, we're starting to realize that maybe some of these plants that we're bringing over aren't all that good. So in 1907, USDA is issuing or issued this farmer's bulletin on how to eradicate Johnson grass, an invasive plant that had been brought over earlier. 1929, Indiana targets Canada thistle for um, removal by legislation, for control by legislation. Uh, we've got a few other things that come over thanks to the USDA in the early 1900s, lime grass, Korean clover, beefsteak plant. The USDA now, I think, kind of figures out that they've got some problems on their hands, too, by the 19-teens when we have Congress passing the Plant Quarantine Act, which now gives them the power to inspect and quarantine plant shipments. 1921, in the revision of Trees of Indiana, Charles C. Deem notes the tree of heaven and white mulberry are now established in Indiana. World War I caused a disruption of the supply of wheat. Now, this is really notable because uh, Fred, uh, President Wilson uh, coined the term, plant more wheat, wheat will win the war. And we were encouraging all of these folks, remember the folks who had all moved out west to uh, the homesteaders to grow more and more wheat. And wheat was very expensive at that time period. And they were crashing as much prairie land as they can to plant more and more wheat, but they didn't really know 
how to do sustainable farming practices at this time. And so this resulted in really kind of some bad things that we'll see in a little bit. I'm going to skip a little bit because we're getting super short on time. 1924 reed canary grass is um, is Im import exported from Europe to America. So reed canary grass is an interesting plant because technically it's native to both North America and Europe. And it was used for forage in North America. But as our needs for more and more forage increased, we didn't have enough reed canary grass to be able to supply the needs of the ranchers. And so we inter introduced more reed canary grass from Europe, which even though it's the same species as a different genotype, and when the two got together, they created the extremely invasive reed canary grass that we know today. And this was a USDA pamphlet that we found that is extolling the virtues of reed canary grass. Around this time, we, we were seeing, like, as a result of the widespread deforestation of Indiana, we're seeing animals start to disappear. And then in 1930, we have the perfect storm, so to speak. We have all of these poor farming practices that were taking place in the American West, the um, the, the widespread plowing of the prairie along with poor farming techniques coupled with a historic drought led to the Dust Bowl. And when the Dust Bowl began, uh, as the winds picked up, it carried the topsoil of the American West eastward in many cases all the way to the East Coast. The photograph that you see on the top right, of course, is Washington, D.C., where that actually got the finally got the attention of the Congress people at that time that they had to do something. And um, notably, my my grandparents lived in Chicago at the time. I think that's a that's yeah, a picture of Chicago in the bottom right. And they remember my father remembers them telling stories about seeing the the Dust Bowl or the uh, the topsoil from the American West blowing over Chicago on its way to the East Coast and into the Atlantic Ocean. And if you notice the very bottom there, the USDA sets up the Bureau of Plant Industry, um, you'll see this as we get into how things really start to go south botanically and ecologically for America. We continue to go and look for plants that come from other countries to fix it. And uh, it seems to be a reoccurring theme. In the case of the prairies, so little was even studied of the prairies that there was very little information as to even some of the plants that were there. And it's just unfortunate because they no one looks to the plants that used to be here as a solution. Right. They went looking for other places. They went, look, went, went back to Eastern Asia to try to find the plants to fix the topsoil problems that we had in the U.S. This I added a, this. Yeah, I added yeah. this just to, for context, um, just to show. So this is uh, blue stem, probably big blue stem. And you can see, I'm not sure if this picture was taken post-dust storm, uh, but you can see how that clump of soil is being held together and, and because of the native plant that's on top of it in the prairie. And um, it's telling photo. And again, it doesn't occur to anyone during this time to look to, to our native plants as a solution. Yeah, and we had a similar crisis here in Indiana, right? We had very poor farming practices, particularly in southern Indiana, where the terrain was just not suitable for farming. And by 1934, enough people had taken down the trees, tried farming unsuccessfully. We had huge erosion problems. Folks moved away and just abandoned their land. And this is how the Hoosier National Forest came to be at the request of Indiana. The, the federal government stepped in and bought that land and started replanting. And of course, they didn't replant it with the things that were there before. And so this is a, a photo on the right is a, a red pine plantation, which is not native to Indiana, being planted in the Hoosier National Forest in the mid-1930s or so. Which are now 19... largely starting to die, I believe. Those are coming at the end of their lifespan in southern Indiana at this point. In 1935, we had the infamous Black Sunday, which was the worst storm of the Dust Bowl, which carried, you can see this photo of it, which is staggering. Cattle were dying. People thought that Armageddon had come. It was frightening, to say the least and displaced an estimated 300,000 tons of 
prairie topsoil. This was the the storm that was the final straw for a lot of the homesteaders. And you think of like Woody Guthrie in this time period and the Okies, they all fled for California and abandoned the land out there. It was not suitable for farming or much of anything anymore, as evidenced by the the poster here and, and the photo here of the aftermath of the Dust Bowl. So this was kind of a, a the environment environmental crisis was met with a reckoning two weeks after Black Sunday. Congress establishes the Soil Conservation Service or SCS, which remained the SCS for decades. We know it now as NRCS, the Natural Resources Conservation Service. And the SCS drafted this model law that served as the template for soil and water conservation districts across the America. So that's where they all came from. And as part of the Work Progress Administration, the New Deal, one of the things that they did was the Shelter Belt Project, which was planting trees in the American West as windbreaks. Of course, did they plant the right trees, Amanda? <laughs> no, they went to <laughs> exotic plants. Maybe, but <laughs> yeah, so uh, Chinese Siberian elms and the Russian olive were commonly planted. One quote from Walter Webb indicates that 75% or more of all new shade trees and park trees planted within this area in the last few years were the Chinese elms. So shelter belt projects certainly were planting a lot of invasive species, what would become invasive species at the same time. Meanwhile, we're really promoting a lot of species that are going to be good for agriculture, for wildlife, for you know, creating hedges and fence roads and this type of thing. So you can see the uh, different, you know, the different species that they're touting, multiflora rows. And um, the shrub, I'm not for sure what that was for, but it was something bad. And there are uh, lots of different pamphlets on this, even in the next slide. So some of the ones that uh, we struggle with today uh, were planted by organizations who were experts at the time and, and trusted. So unfortunately, all, all USDA pamphlets. And then in the 1930s onward, the, aquari the aquarium and pond trade grows in popularity. So does the uptick in aquatic invasive plants. We'll go through all of them, but some notable ones, hydrilla and Eurasian water milfoil came over around that time. There's some other ones. In the 20th century, we see a uh, really kind of a decrease, though, of the introduction of invasive terrestrial plants and an uptick in the introduction of the aquatic invasive plants, which is, again, largely attributed to the aquarium and the landscape pond trade. So if we fast forward in the 1970s, now we have, that's really the decade where there was the a huge reckoning where we had things like the Clean Air and Clean Water Act and the Invasive Species, or excuse me, the uh, Endangered Species Act all took place in the 1970s. Um, coupled with that, we had the Federal Noxious Weed Act. USDA's Plant Inspection Service, or APHIS, created the first federal noxious weed list. So this was really, I, mean, I think the, the 1970s was really sort of the, the dawn of, of um, modern conservation in terms of recognizing the damages from some of these invasive plants. And this is a, a graph that we're, I think this is like the second to last slide, but um, a graph that we have which shows the introduction. Again, these are the of Indiana's officially invasive plants, the green line or the, the green portion of the graph being terrestrial, the blue portion being aquatic. And you can really see the important events, how the important events such as the start of the horticulture trade and the Perry expedition in particular influenced the introduction of invasive plants. And really that 1860s to 1880s time period was was really horrible following the um, the Perry expedition. And then later in the 20th century, we see a big drop in the introduction of terrestrial plants and increase in aquatic plants. However, we should preface that by saying that a lot of these plants that are currently invasive didn't become invasive right away. And so even though it looks like we've got a handle on the problem, we may have more things that were introduced in the 20th century that just haven't become super problematic yet. So calorie pear, for example, we mentioned was introduced, I think, in 1908 by the USDA. Well, it languished in a USDA test field for four decades or so until the 1950s 
a USDA plant breeder saw um, a nice looking one that was growing that had been planted in the ni early 1900s. It was still growing there. And he thought it had ornamental use to it, ornamental potential. And he made cuttings from it and he grew those cuttings into trees of their own. Well, they're all clones, of course, right? When you propagate by, cut by cuttings. And um, those cuttings became the first ornamental calorie pear tree, which we know as Bradford pear, was created from those um, leftover cuttings from the early 1900s and actively promoted by the USDA in the 1950s and the 1960s. They thought that they had a great street tree here because it was it had lots of benefits to it. It didn't produce fruit. Bradford didn't. It was sterile and it had a nice form to it and it had pretty flowers and didn't grow too tall and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, what have we learned from all of this? We have a lot of different agencies. I get this is good that we have these agencies now, but it's bad that we have the need for them because we have done so much damage. Our um, our ancestors have done so much damage that we now have to reckon with the damage that they've done and throw well, a lot of time and money at it. And going back to our original project, looking at current street trees that are being used um, with our tax dollars in different municipalities through Indiana, um, several of them still are, um, even though in some cases it's not, it's not even allowed or it's illegal, um, still have things like black alder and others. Of course, Bradford pear, the calorie pear, uh, there was opposition uh, by the landscape trade and adding that as a banned species um, to our terrestrial rule, uh, burning bush and, and some of the others. And so uh, we're still essentially somewhat at in, within the grips of the, the horticultural trade in some cases. And this idea that what's aesthetically pleasing to, um, to the city planners and to our horticultural trade is what's getting planted. There's trees like the heart, the hardy rubber tree, for instance, is the, is that the one at Holiday Park? Yep. Yeah. And so that was planted, I think, what, back 80 years ago? And, 19, um, 1940s, I think. Okay. So now um, it's becoming an, an terrible invasive for Holiday Park. And this will be one that I would, I would suspect within our lifetime, we're going to see put on a new invasive species list for Indiana. Um, so many of these trees that we're seeing ornamentally planted that are non-native, almost certainly based on the fact that they're already showing, escaping, they're escaping and naturalizing, will become a problem. So we still have an ongoing issue and we still really haven't addressed aesthetically what we need to marry up, what we feel aesthetically is important with um, what's ecologically important. You know, and we're, we're kind of preaching to the choir, to the Native Plant Society, but Native plants are are always the best solution for things, right? And it's it's interesting as we took this journey ourselves in researching all of this, we can understand like well, what the mindset of people were at the time, why people like Thomas Jefferson wanted to have the latest exotic plant at his garden. It was really a kind of a status thing to have these exotic, wonderful plants. You know, in those days, they couldn't go to Walmart and buy them. They had to get them from some guy who would, you know, send you seed from the, the old world or something. So um, you know, we, we, we see these distinct periods in American history that were responsible for some of these trends. And we hope not to repeat them, I guess, right? And we didn't have there were in there was no native plant society in 1850 right <laughs> they, instead there was just the opposite there was the you know the exotic plant people mm -hmm. who were who were doing completely opposite of what we're condoning now so hopefully we've learned some things from this but you know, again native is always the best choice i see we have several questions i've been trying to keep a close eye on that. One was, uh, I think we've had two about plants that are U.S. plants that have become invasive elsewhere. I know that we have several species of goldenrod that are problematic in Europe and Africa and other places. Yeah, there's um, a there's a, a good example or good story. Um, one that is exotic in, or excuse me, super invasive in Europe is our native black cherry tree, Prunus mm -hmm. serotina, um, wild black cherry. And they did a study on this and they why is it not invasive in Indiana, but it's like terribly invasive in 
Germany or whatever, right? And the the study grew Prunus serotina in two different soil mediums. Soil medium one was its native soil that they they dug it from in North America, and soil number two was sterile soil that like potting mix or something like that, right? And they found that the the black cherry trees that were growing in the sterile soil were growing at like double the rate that the trees were growing in the native soil, leading the scientists to conclude that there was some sort of growth inhibitor that was in the native soil that had over the course of thousands of years, they'd struck this ecological balance uh, to keep these trees in check. And that whatever's present in that soil is not present in the European soil. And so, um, yeah, it works both ways for sure. Importing and exporting has um, a lot of the things that they've come from the U.S. have done damage in other places and as well. Another question is related to lesser celadine and in the explanation that we might have for how um, how much it's really taken off in the last five years. So they say since it's been here since 1862. Um, this tends to be something that we see with plants. Sometimes it's uh, like with the Bradford pear across pollination. It could be, it could be, certainly climate could be at play with the, the reason that some trees and plants um, kind of jump the shark, if you will, of uh, popular culture reference, but just essentially start to um, really become an issue. I think it was the IMA grounds um, back probably close to 10 years ago, I saw it growing and um, assumed it was a marsh marigold and pointed it out during a hike and realized that it, it wasn't marsh marigold. Um, I, I've also, you know, I'm walking around my my town here in Westfield at times and noticing trees that I can't tell you what they are. Um, I think it was the Japanese tree lilac I kept seeing planted and I'm like, what is this tree? Of course, I go to my field guide and try to figure out what it is. It's not in my my 101 trees of Indiana guide. You know, these are just non-native trees that are just getting planted just crazy um, amounts of, you know, it's just unfortunate to see. And again, those trees might be well behaved for a while until they're not. Um, and then Steve, um, I can't tell you how fascinating this has been, this whole presentation. I really appreciate your time and your expertise here. And I will definitely be recommending, as I said, we're recording this, it'll be available on the INPS YouTube channel. And I'm definitely going to recommend it to anybody who works in, works with, or is interested in invasive species, both in Indiana, but actually across the globe. It's all very pertinent, right? It is. And yeah, our trees, are, yeah, our plants, everybody has plants that are ecologically sustainable um, and, and provide ecosystem services within our own communities. So um we had a gentleman from what India recently that has moved to Indiana and, and contacted us about it. And, you know, it's really the responsibility of, of where you go uh, to get interested in their local wildlife and their local plants. And that person was doing that. And I applaud that. Um, and really kind of going back to our project uh, more broadly, our hope is to provide these books and these guides that will help people um, educate more uh, within their community, um, show up to the tree boards and to, um, you know, the council meetings and these types of things when, when plants are being discussed and, you know, we're looking at obviously zoning issues, but um, these, these plant lists can be challenged and um, really take the people um, you know, that, that are the constituents to speak up and to ask uh, for more forethought related to the plants that we're putting along our streets and everything else. So, And I encourage everybody here tonight to um, follow up along with the rest of us um, with the upcoming publications that will be coming from Amanda and Steve. Um, I really look forward to that. I will be recommending them. As I said, also recommend recording of this on the INPS YouTube channel. If I may, I would like to follow up with one last question that kind of came to my mind throughout the presentation. Um, I've become aware, I've been told that often a, a lot of the African enslaved people that were brought over here in our history brought um, important plants with them. 
knowing that it would be important. Did any of that show up in your research? Have you seen any of that documentation by any chance? No, we we have found I, virtually no African plants that um, are invasive. Now, there may have been a couple of things that are kind of from Eurasia and maybe a little bit of Northern Africa, but I think for the most part, the climate is probably so different from the areas where they would have come from that it um, it maybe is why we we don't have escape populations. That things. makes a lot of sense, actually. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we have to... like crops like you know, I think of like sweet potatoes were I think originally from Africa, and you know they're you know, they're we can grow them here, but we can't grow them as you know they're not, they're not perennial crops or whatever that that escape. Um, so with that said, would you say that the, I guess, maybe longitudinal range of a plant is going to speak to where it might succeed or not, or be invasive or not? So, be invasive? so this is, this speaks to another one of our upcoming writings uh, where we talk about the history of ecology. And there was a, a German explorer slash scientist, Alexander von Humboldt who was the first scientist who came up with the uh, the concept that uh, different different climates of uh, in different in the similar types of climates in different parts of the world sustain similar types of species so for example if you look at um uh, the climate of Indiana and the invasive plants that we have here, most of them came from other parts of the world that had similar climates to ours. So uh, yeah, like latitude plays into that, but uh, there are some other things as well. Um, ocean currents. And, latitude, uh, I didn't mean longitude, latitude. It's been a while. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, there's okay. definitely something to that. And um, we owe a lot of that research to uh, von Humboldt back in the early 1800s on, on his travels and putting together two and two and figuring out that hey like some of the plants that I'm seeing in this climate are really similar to the plants that I saw growing in my native Germany right right so, uh, your question original question Brooke is really interesting I I but no we haven't I think you know when we we did look at uh country of origin in the list that will be in the you know eventually published um, information, and um, very few African plants show up. So it is a very different climate. Like yeah. you said, um, I think that that makes sense. I just mm -hmm. um, I was just curious when you think of plants traveling and you know everything that was going on in our nation. Then I just wondered, but it makes sense that the climates yeah. are so very it's different. It's unfortunate to think about too, but when you think about the ballasts of the ships, in many cases were filled with people, um, you know, initially, and then, and therefore those ballasts from Africa were, because they were filled with people, weren't necessarily filled with dry, you know, ballast material or water. So they had people in them, which probably prevented uh, some of that transfer as well, potentially right. unintentional transfer. So, right. Yeah. Uh um we have learned not some things point, like this. but not positive right but understood very pertinent yeah. appreciate that we have a, a question from barbara jablonski she's wondering if your books or your volumes are available to us and how i know you said they're upcoming um do you have any expected dates or sources for your publications <laughs> Well, they'll be free and they will yeah. be made electronically available. The first one um, is uh, tonight's program. So we weren't going to do this program. We weren't going to break this off into a program. This was this was actually started out to be a chapter of a larger book. And we wound up putting so much time into it that we figured like, okay, this is a standalone uh, document. And, we, and plus we felt we need to... Um, we needed to show folks that we had been doing some work for the last 18 months and and not just um you know because we around. really suspected you weren't right <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we'll have we'll have this first one out um gosh it's it's 95 percent done uh, we got to put some finishing touches on it and then awesome. give it to our, our proofreaders the other ones will be a little a while down the line yet but um okay. 
this is this one will have i don't know amanda you want to like make, make set a guess. deadline set a deadline oh yeah. gosh memorial so, day i'll say summer. i don't want to be on the spot summer yeah. okay well just um so that people know um would a good way to stay in the know be to find your facebook group in the nature yeah, it, yeah. Uh, Indiana Nature is our Facebook group. We also have a page. In, in Nature. Uh, or, sorry, yeah, In Nature. Is I, I, capital I N. Am. Capital yes. I, capital N. Yes, right. I um, In Nature. But we have a website too, and it would, it'll would it be hosted on the website. So if okay. you're not, if social media is not for you, not interested, you can also just kind of keep back, keep in touch with um the website or shoot us a message our emails on the okay. website and uh, let indiana us know indiana nature.net all yeah. right indiana nature nature.net and i am going to actually steve can i ask you to put that in the chat because i'm not sure if it's sure. spelled out or not so i can I, if you I don't one of you don't mind putting it in the chat so people can get their eyeballs on it and um i think that a lot of people here tonight will want to follow that um, again, it's absolutely fascinating information. And as we try and do the work to, if not eradicate, at least manage these populations, I think it's incredibly helpful to understand this history so we don't repeat it. And so, so much of the information that you have shared tonight is only going to help in our efforts. And yes, yeah, Steve, I think you need to introduce your sleeping kitty because many people have just noticed yeah, that this is sleeping. This is Tigger. He was my my parents' cat, and my um, my mother passed away three years ago. My father passed away just over a year ago, and so he's a he's a very affectionate uh, six year old tabby cat that um, he's had everybody he's ever known in his life um, leave him, and so he Aww. pretty much never. Uh, if I'm if I'm around the house, he's pretty much next to me all the time. <laughs> he's a he's a good boy. Well, we sure <laughs> do appreciate him joining in. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, a nice, a nice addition tonight. Um, at this point, I know we're at 830 and I don't want to keep folks too long. Of course, people can jump off anytime they want. But if there are any final questions or comments, please feel free to unmute yourself or put them in the chat. I'm going to just give us um, a few moments here to um, to see those. Otherwise, I Again, really, um, Amanda and Steve, I, I really want to thank you for not only taking the time tonight to share this with us, but for doing the work, for really putting the time and the effort into the work and sharing this body of knowledge is so important to the work that we do with invasive species. Well, it means a lot to us to present, um, especially with your group. It's been a while since we've been back. And so it, it it is also nice and and to share this information is is great. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Well done. Yeah, very well done. You guys are a great team. I certainly will be recommending your presentation to <laughs> many many people. Thank Hi, you, Barb. We're happy to do it. Hi, Barb. <laughs> <laughs> I see a lot of friends on here, so I want to say hi to everybody. But <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> hey, I also wanted to um, call to note, Amy Perry in the chat says this would make a good presentation for the state conference. And I agree. I think this year is already planned out. But um, in thinking about dates of release for your publications, I think we should keep in mind a presentation okay. at our annual conference. I think it would be. That would be interesting. Really well <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I think that I think the audience um, would be really well received. Gail is asking, do you know yeah. how to compare exotic bulbs such as Scylla, which I really want to know also. This like, is like, how yeah. Flowering, it would be great to know. Yeah, that star of Bethlehem, that kind of bulb too. Mm -hmm. The best I've heard is essentially just digging them up, but um, mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't know. Steve, is there any herbicide? That's one I'm not sure that. I don't know. I've never attempted I, i've always just dug them as well um they they come out relatively easily i suppose as far as digging things go but however there's a lot the it, soil so right now yeah. is a great time to be doing it while the soil is still moist as it heats up i assume yeah. it's going to be a lot harder right right i i agree that's been my observation as well okay 
All right. All right. Well, it looks like your cat there wants some attention <laughs> away from the screen. So with oh, that, got we'll her probably cats, wrap yeah. it up. Um, I really, again, I thank you both so much for doing this tonight. I thank everybody else for being here tonight. I hope you learned as much as I did. Um, it's definitely been time well spent. So Amanda, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much on such great work done. Thank you so much. I'll we'll, we will make sure that everybody has a link to the the final publications as we had to Excellent. obviously we we took a lot of we, a lot of stuff that's in the book is didn't make it into um, the program because just for time. Sure. Absolutely. Things. Absolutely. Well, I think everybody here will be following you guys on your website and or your Facebook page, um, which I always really enjoy the group, the Facebook group. Uh, I in nature, so much a wealth of knowledge to be shared there. So thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you Thanks everybody. again. Have a Have good a evening. Bye, everybody. Bye bye.